Hey, this is the Level Up Engineering Podcast, where we talk with some of the most successful engineering leaders who reveal actionable management insights that help you take your developer team to the next level. This episode is brought to you by Coding Sans, a software development agency building web applications from design to delivery with React, Node.js, and Angular. Check them out at CodingSans.com. Hi there, everyone. Carolina Todd speaking, and this is the Level Up Engineering Podcast. I am introducing our newest guest, Pau Minovas. He is CTO at Typeform, and we are going to talk about scaling Typeform and changing its culture. But before that, I would like to hand it over to Pau and ask him to tell us a bit about himself, what he does for a living and what he does for fun. Thanks uh, for having me. It's a ha- I'm very happy to be here. Um, I started uh, a long time ago as a developer when I was 16. Uh, I have to say I have not been a developer for the last 10 years. I've been uh, chaining a number of uh, positions in different companies, always not looking for but finding scalability pains. Uh, big companies, small companies, new departments that were uh, struggling with growth and they were struggling with success. Uh, sometimes joining in time, course correct, in other times uh, trying to firefight uh, the consequences of that. Uh, and that has led me through a number of very different domains from music fingerprinting to electronic voting, uh, now data ask or UX orientation, um, a little bit of everything, to be honest. On my free time, if I have any, I actually have a, almost a two year old. Uh, who is constantly competing for Typeform for who is the main project, who is the side project. Uh, so I don't actually have time for much hobbies after that. So that's what keeps me busy. I bet. I bet. And especially uh, in the pandemic and, and after the pandemic with most of us being at home, I'm sure it's uh, kind of challenging to have such a, such a young child. She was actually born three months into the pandemic. That was also an interesting experience. I am sure. I am sure. Awesome. Um, so we are talking about scaling type form in, in this very episode, but you have a lot of experience in, in scaling teams and, and turning them over. Um, but please give us some context as to how type forms engineering team looked when you arrived at the company and how it looks right now. You have been working there for over three years, if I am not mistaken. Correct. I joined in April uh, uh, 19. Back then, engineering was a team of 50 people that even included IT and security. Uh, We are now a team of over 150 and we'll soon be 200 because we're growing very quickly. Uh, And a lot of things have happened in the last three years, actually. We we joined in a moment where the company was very stressed with growing pains. Uh, We joined as a new leadership team and we actually had to fix a lot of the pains, listen to a lot of people, uh, go back to basics in some aspects and make sure we would learn to walk before run, making sure we're leaving nobody behind um, and then fixing one problem until the other, until we enjoyed the, I would say the amazing culture that we have today uh, in our engineering teams. That sounds uh, like a pretty big project. Um, what- it's been intense. <laughs> What were what were some of the some of the the pains that the company was having when you joined? You essentially from the outside you would immediately see trouble getting things done and a lot of frustration of people that wanted to do amazing things were in a place where they could do it. The resources were there, the opportunities were there. We always had a, a, an amazing product, an amazing product roadmap, uh, but just getting stuff done was very very difficult. Um, it was hard to coordinate. Not everybody was playing on the same direction, even if trying. Um, and that obviously over time creates frustration, um, lowers engagement. Um, so the first thing we had to do was essentially join, stop, talk with everybody. What's your story? What do you want to do? Why you can't do it? And try to piece the story together of all those pieces. And then from this, a roadmap of, all right, let's focus on that problem. And after this, let's focus on that problem. And that's been a three, very intense three-year journey of fixing one thing after the other. 
Mm-hmm. And the, how would you how would you describe what the engineering team looks like right now? What are the different vibes? I I am imagining that people are much safer to do things that they enjoy and they are maybe more engaged in the workplace. Yes, uh, so we have a much more uh, stable structure. We have much more stable teams. It's in a Spotify model, like many people have. Like we have learned uh, that it works, it's downfalls, and we have also learned to correct those downfalls. Um, Typhoon has always had a very strong sense of team autonomy. Um, that was already there when we joined, and we always thought that is a jewel that we have to nurture and we have to build upon. So we, that's been a constant of all the changes that we've done to actually articulate that team autonomy. Uh, it's obviously a place where we care a lot about UX because that's very related to our mission. It's a place where we care a lot about security because at the end of the day, we are a data ask company. We ask people to give us their data, and that's a huge honor and a huge responsibility. That also you'll see that. Um, and Typhoon was born as an innovation, uh, was loved by innovators. So I would say innovation is also a, a big theme and a big value of our engineering culture today. I love that. Uh, thank you. Um, so you mentioned that the entire leadership kind of changed at the same time. Um, what it's, it's always hard for people to change and, and for people to join new companies as a leader. And uh, I'm sure it can even be more difficult when you change as part of a part of a sweeping change. What can you tell us about being the trusted leader that you are today? How did you kind of get into um, the position of gaining the the trust of the of the engineering team? Well, you fail and learn along the way uh, by doing these things. I think you have to be very humble and very honest and you'll make mistakes and you'll own them. Uh, and over time, you have to connect uh, what are you trying to do, where are you trying to go? Be very clear with that. Let people not be okay with it because that's also fine. Um, making sure you're extremely straight with everybody that stays and everybody that wants to join. Hey, this is who we are. This is where we are. This is what we are not. Right. This is where we are going. If that's the journey you want to be on, that's amazing. If that if that does not call you, that's also fine. Right. Maybe you'll be happier somewhere else. Um, and after this, connecting the solutions that you wanna build to get us there with the real pains that people is having. Because if you have great people and we do have great people, um, they just want to do stuff. They want to do great stuff. Right. They just can't for some reasons, and you gotta listen to that. And you got to connect, uh, all right, let's fix this next. And this is how our current pains are solved. And also we've learned this the hard, the hard way also, sometimes trying to go for great before we do good, uh, go for the next level before getting people buy in or understanding on where we go there. And, and I think it's always an exercise of balance uh, between these two things. Mm -hmm. uh, I love that. Could you share any stories if, um... If you if you remember any people maybe leaving when this when this scaling began, do you do you have any anybody who you can recall who didn't really like the the vision or or couldn't identify with with the changes? I mean, sharing personal stories is always delicate, of course, because people is obviously entitled to their privacy. But I think there was a bunch of people who just folded back. Uh, to 20 people engineering teams, but that's because that's what they actually enjoyed the more. And by when I joined with Typhoon was not already a 20 people engineering team, we're already 50 and growing, right? Uh, so I remember having a bunch of those conversations and saying, look, there are very different kinds of companies. And actually I know, and I, I, I remain in contact with many of these people that just enjoy a different environment and a different kind of challenge and just explicitly being very okay with this. There's nothing bad with that. I love that. And so what did the people who remained um, tell you? Did they at all get scared or did they trust your leadership? Was there any kind of drawbacks that you that you had to overcome with people leaving? The I do believe that, uh, and, and you'll see this when we talk about some of the changes we've done, uh, the overall sense is that 
you can do a lot now, and that engages a lot of people. People has uh, um, teams that have a lot of autonomy, a lot of decision making, and we celebrate that decision making. We celebrate when we make bad decisions and we suffer the consequences, and we learn and we cost correct, and that's also okay. Um, the for me the the most defining turning point in in terms of culture is when the teams became much more opinionated about what they wanted to do next. Uh, and when we had that, we saw that we had the right culture, and that that was that was something to just nurture and keep building. Um, and that took us some time, um, but it's when we know we made it in that regard. And that was, I would say, early 2020. Wow. Okay. So so it took a year almost. Yeah, six to, to nine to months. Get to that point. Awesome. Thank you. So. What the, you you have described a, a three year growth? Um, mm -hmm. What was that kind of one of the goals to grow the engineering team so much, or was it kind of just a side thing while you were achieving some some vision or or goals? I mean, growing the team is never an objective on itself. But when you are at Typhoon and you've been growing 50% every year along the last eight years, uh, I think the company has multiplied by three in these three years. Uh, that's just an unavoidable consequence uh, that you will need people to power all of this and, and to execute on those roadmaps. Um, but we have also always tried to be very clear on this is, a, this is an opportunity to Right, it's an end up expanding opportunities. We have things to fix. Whatever you look at, uh, there is always room for more people. This is a constant stream of amazing people that's joining that. And, and again, being very clear, it, it's a journey of growth, right? Which it's good things and it's bad things. So if you sign up for this, you're going to have an amazing time. Mm -hmm. uh, did your role change at all while you were while you oh, were yes. orchestrating this growth, and how so? Um, well, when I joined, there were 50 um, engineers and barely any manager at all, not even team leads. So my first job was essentially be everybody's team lead um, and then get into the company, gradually uh, promote internal talent to managerial positions, making sure that was clear and they knew what that meant um, <laughs> because there were a lot of confusion around this, um, getting in. Uh, leaders from the outside. I say leaders, not managers, because some leaders are on the technical track, right? And you also need that. Um, and then it's been a journey of me gradually being first everybody's team lead, then everybody's engineering director or everybody's manager, then everybody's the VP of engineering, and, and finally uh, uh, focusing on being everybody's CTO, which is also a kind of different job. Mm -hmm. What was kind of the the job description that you signed up for and and what what is your job description now? I don't think the job description has changed. So, so maybe because it's very it's very high level. Uh, uh -huh. You want to you want to get an excellent engineering team uh, to execute on this product vision. I personally joined very driven by the product that we wanted to build. And, uh, and and being able to create a team that's going to build it. And I do still think that's a very important thing to do. And I still see it, our product vision, and it's very engaging for me. But I think through the through these three years, I have learned that they will build the product. What I can build for them is the culture that's going to build that product. Um, and that, for me, has been a, 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 an important change. I think the job description that my CEO would say is still writes more or less the same, but how I approach the problem has changed. We are now much more focused on making sure our talent grows, we do change management properly, we have better internal communications, so everybody has a better environment. And then I don't worry at all, the product will be built. I love that giving people the autonomy to to do what they do best. Okay, so you make it sound like kind of an easy ride from 2019 <laughs> to 2022. Um, what were some of your biggest challenges that you that you had to overcome in the past three years, and um, and how did you how did you face them? So a little bit chronologically. If you want, because every every challenge and every solution builds on 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 the previous ones. Um, <clears throat> initially, we had 
a culture of you build it, you own it, which is very common on a small startups, right? When you have uh, some people that are the only ones who know how to touch that part of the code, and you can see even the rest, that they don't dare make a pull request because either they feel they are not skilled or they wouldn't want to touch somebody else's uh, domain. And we had to move out of that very, very quickly. So one of the things we insisted on at the beginning is on the internal open source model uh, where everything was visible, everything was owned, which is not the case when we joined. There were some areas of the code base more owned than other areas. Um, and that, and that was tough because there were some pieces that were uncomfortable to own, uh, but also empowering people and say, when you own something, you can also kill it, right? You can simplify it and you can get rid of it. That's within what ownership meant. Um, and focusing a lot on people on don't wait, don't have dependencies on others, self-service as much as you can, and saying that ownership is you merge it, you own it, right? Which is what open source communities do. Somebody else writes the code, it's a contribution, they are not the accountable for the quality. They are doing their best. They are trying to self-serve. They may have the knowledge. They may not, obviously, because nobody can know all, all the code base. Um, but it's the team who receives the pull request to review this, who needs to say, yeah, I'm going to match that to my code base, meaning I'm going to I'm going to own the consequences of this if this is not good or if this is not aligned with the architecture. And, and that took a lot of hand-holding, a lot of pair programming, a lot of conversations to make sure we made that cultural shift. Um, but I think it's the best thing we could do back then because it really enabled a lot of people uh, and it really killed a lot of the unnecessary dependencies that we had and waiting times that we had on stuff like this. That was definitely one of the, of the first ones in parallel to this, of course, hiding and onboarding, especially onboarding, making sure we were having a good candidate experience, a fast candidate experience, uh, and we were very straight about what are we looking for, what kind of journey we are, what you should sign up for. Um, and then the onboarding, making sure every team owned the people that was coming. That means you need to have some level of documentation, some level of tooling. Uh, and we did, uh, we did something that was very well for us, which is a bootcamp before you, after you have the corporate onboarding, so you have your laptop and your account and everything, before you join the team you will uh, end up being on, you're gonna roam to three teams that are probably around the team you're gonna end up being, and you're gonna be there for two, three days, and you will just make a pull request. You will fix a bug or do a story, Some pro probably it's something unimportant. Uh, it's not to give you pressure, but you'll know the people it will come handy later. You will be embedded on the culture. You will have to set up the tools. You will learn more about your surroundings. And this, we find out, came very, very handy after you ended up being on your final team because you know everybody else. You know who to go to. You know um, how the teams that depend on you work, the teams that you depend on work. Um, and that was really, really useful. Um, to enable that first growth, where we went from 50 to 100 people in roughly six months. Wow. And um, how long uh, was your boot camp? I think it was, the corporate onboarding was like three, four days. Um, this boot camp phase was between one week and two. And <laughs> then there was another week of onboarding on your final team, which obviously <laughs> changes a lot depending on the team, depending on the pressures that we had sometimes we had to write some things uh, but on average that was that was the the awarding time uh so it sounds like this would put a lot of pressure on the teams who are already in the company because they would have to teach a lot of people kind of at the same time how did the existing teams face this challenge what was the the general attitude towards uh, this rapid growth it does put pressure, but you have this pressure anyways when you have the people joining. So, and, and manage, not managing that pressure actually doesn't make it easy. Uh, and we were very clear with teams, you're gonna get a stream of newbies going through your teams that may end up not even being part of your team. So make sure you get your rhythm is right, your week is right, your tools, uh, welcome trails created because you're gonna use them. And actually we do so, a lot of the teams naturally started to take care of their wikis better, prepare for these things, having frequently asked questions. Um, so an investment in documentation, if you want, and better tool set up to be able to cope 
with those uh, newbies, uh, and we see that as a clear uh, net improvement, right? Because it's easy to leave documentation behind, um, but it, then it's a good solution when you clearly see the problem it's fixing, right? I love that. So was it, um, I, I, this bootcamp uh, idea is really exciting to me. Was it, um, was it that you would hire people for the team or did, did you hire people for the kind of atmosphere? And then while they were going through the bootcamp, they kind of figured out which team would fit their personal growth best. So, somehow in the middle. Um, one of the things we change on the hiring process is we don't hire for teams anymore. Uh, we hire for Typhoon. We hire for the engineering culture. Um, as a mindset, we like that in principle, you join the broader team, right? Uh, but also for very practical reasons. Before, but the moment we make you an offer and the moment you join, a lot of things can happen on a scale up. Sometimes, sometimes if we tell you're gonna go to this team, it's very hard to keep that promise, right? And that was just adding uh, problems. Plus, you wanna be straight with people. You're going, you're going to a place where there is change. So you may join a team and six months later be somewhere else and that's, that's fine. So don't make promise you can't keep. At the very beginning, starting on the interviews, um, which was also healthy, I believe, because we would be able to explain candidates our general values and our general story and, and our general situation and not so much some team specifics um, that may or not may be true three months in, right? Um, and so that we, we put a lot of effort on moving away um, from hiring for particular teams. Now, when people joined, they got a team and that bootcamp, they were already knowing in which team they were going to end up. Actually, the bootcamp is designed with a final team in mind, right? Which teams is that person is going to go to that team. What are the useful teams, right? That person can go through before ending up there. Mm -hmm. But it also sounds like the people who you were hiring also had to be flexible enough to, to kind of go with the flow of uh, what type form needs from them. Exactly. And I do believe that uh, that's also an honest point, right? If you, ho if you join not type form, any high growth, uh, a scale up, you can need to buy in into that kind of change appetite, right? That will, that will just happen regardless. Right, 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 right. Okay. So we kind of, um, got stuck on, um, on hiring and onboarding. Uh, that's my fault. Um, were there any other challenges that you think are worth mentioning for our listeners to be aware when, when scaling uh, so quickly? Um, very more than tied to scaling quickly, very tied to being a not so big of a company not long time ago. What we had was um, a lot of the production issues rooted to the infrastructure teams. And they were behaving like absolute heroes dealing with a lot of incidents. Uh, that was not healthy. And they shouldn't be heroes. And most of the times they cannot even fix the issues, right? They still need to find out who actually knows about this service. Uh, so we invested a lot very, very quickly uh, on the microservice architectures that we had that was already Kubernetes and Terraform based, but we were not leveraging it in order to give root incidents to team, make sure they own it. Again, it's very coupled with the ownership philosophy, right? If you own it, that also means the incidents are going to go to you and you can make your own decisions, but you'll also be the one being called in the night if the things go south, right? Uh, so articulating that. Uh, and then the other side of the coin of this, which is if you read incidents to an engineering, to a product team, they need to be able to operate the infrastructure. They need to be able to uh, manage their own pods beyond what we had in that moment. So we had to do that last mile um, to make sure incidents were going to the teams. And actually that worked very, very well. Um, people started to be much more empowered. They could make quality decisions. These quality decisions lead, need less consensus across the teams, they could be like more local and you could just watch from the outside are the high levels quality metrics like trending to good or are they trending to bad and we need to talk about it. Um, but no news, good news, right? Which is a, is a always uh, a way of empowering the teams. Um, so that was actually one of the changes we did late, late 19 um, to make sure, again, we're building on the same concept of team autonomy, but you have to articulate that autonomy, otherwise it doesn't happen. Right. 
Right, right. And it also sounds like it makes things pretty fast if everybody kind of has the right to decide for what they own, um, given that they are really great professionals and they know their stuff, right? Exactly. Um, cool. What uh, processes have you changed? We talked about um, the onboarding and, and also hiring and team, team autonomy. What were kind of the, the necessary changes that you had to make i'm sure a lot of uh, a lot of things had to have changed because it's a huge amount of people who are coming together every day to work yes i think the ones so what we have learned is when you don't have autonomous teams it's kind of a mesh of individuals that can't really move in every direction the moment you have autonomous teams you have autonomous teams that are moving and are moving very quickly but then you have teams to coordinate, right? And sometimes not everything is local to a team. So you need some kind of consensus building mechanism. Uh, and in that sense, we, what we created is what we call standards and proposals. Um, it's a request for comments process. It's very, very simple, um, but it, it's, it's grassroots. Everybody can create a standard. Everybody can propose something. We can find everything from logging standards to linters to moving to TypeScript. Um, deploying new platform capabilities. Everybody can make a proposal. And then we focused on what were our pain points back then, which is truly supporting the proposal makers. What is the good proposal? What do you need to consider, right? How does good look like? How are you going to make change? Stick? Which teams are affected by this change? Just help them make sure that the proposal was always been intended, but sometimes not actionable, right? Make sure it's actionable. Make sure it goes through a process that everybody knows about it. And if there is some people that really are affected by this and needs to say, I'm okay with this, you explicitly get those okays or the non okays. Uh, and then a sponsoring, because there was a lot of proposals that died midway being deployed uh, and being very explicit about. And in that case, I did that personally. At the beginning, actually, I'm happily not doing that anymore because it just flows and that's amazing. Um, but when we say we're going to do something, then we really roll that out, right? So if we, there's a proposal that has enough consensus, it's good. Well, then engineering leadership exists here to say, we're going to do it. And now whoever is affected by this will follow up. We'll put the right epics on the right backlogs in order to make this happen. And that we focused a lot on 2020, I believe. Um, and it's helping a lot. And I've have like over 40 or 50 proposals approved in these last three years, all, all around the, uh, um, the space and it's 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 quite an autopilot which is great it generates a lot of interesting conversations and working groups around particular things feel, people feel passionate about and also you allow them to stretch it on each right they will if they have problems they are naturally motivated to propose solutions to those problems so let let them do it right uh, can you can you maybe elaborate a little bit for our listeners as to how to to make such a co-creative system for for engineers? I I have an idea, uh, but but it sounds like you have to put in some special steps for for everyone to be able to create some standards or propose new standards. And I'm just wondering if we can get some specifics from you so that sure. if our listeners are kind of in the same boat, then they can see where to start. It's deceptively simple. And I think in this simple is better. You just have proposals who are in draft. You have proposals that are in request for comments. And in that phase, we we make an effort to publicize them, make sure they pop up on the engine in all hands, that they are shared on Slack in the right moment. So people, people who's not necessarily paying attention, obviously, to every proposal knows about it and can say, actually, I, I want to read that one. Um, then some proposals are final and we say, okay, that's the final version, right? That's the agreement. Yes. And then some proposals are uh, uh, approved and being rolled out, which is where it becomes more a manager's job to make sure it happens. Um, and you just make sure that you have these four phases. It's very, very simple that you're doing the right things. And in our case, we did have a, a culture of a lot of consent, excessive consensus building, right? A lot of uh -huh. committee decision making. So especially at the beginning, not, now not so much, 
being very explicit about, do you really need these 20 people to talk about this? Who's going to drive this? Can the driver be just one person? And that's fine. Who needs to be informed? Like, let's really take care that not everybody can be on everything, right? Let's be pragmatical. Um, so that was one area where we inside at the beginning and it's now part of the culture. So that, that's not a problem anymore. Um, what, what kind of consensus do you need right now? Is it always task appropriate or like individual standard proposal appropriate? Some proposals are individual. Some proposals is a group of few that push. Uh, we don't need consensus, actually. We don't, we don't vote them, for instance. We don't strive mm -hmm. for consensus. We strive for a clear proposal. Is, the, is there any other proposal of, uh, that's competing with this? Is there an option B? Nope. If there is enough people that think that this is a good, especially the affected teams, um, then it's good to go. Now, you don't need more than that. Wow. And how do proposals fall out of this system what if what if if somebody proposes something that's better then they can also put that to to the standard creation yep pr process. sometimes sometimes some proposal is and actually it's we have a not for now section like proposals go to the not for now section when uh when because mostly they are good but sometimes they are not actionable or there's some more priority stuff. And sometimes they go back from the not for now, back to the draft mode, right? Uh, um, so I don't think we need to block proposals because they are not good. It may be a pragmatical thing about, yes, but that's a platform project and platform is booked on this other thing for six months. So that's not realistic to do this right now. Or yes, that's a good problem to fix, but we have these two other problems that are more important. So it's a, it's not a mother of, saying what we'll, we will not do. It's just a matter of not approving everything at the same time because you can't do everything, right? And, and then very often things go back from the not for now cemetery back to the proposal process because, well, in a year from now, this may be achievable. Yeah, it may be a better jam. I love that. Yeah. I, I, I love that. Thank you for, for elaborating on that one. Sure. Okay. We have talked a lot about the culture and, and uh, how the culture has changed, but we haven't really made like a list of things that, that you changed in your reign as, uh, as the CTO of, of Typeform. What, you grew from, from 50 and I'm sure when you arrived there, there were a lot of talented people who were trying to do good work, but maybe the frame in which they were trying to do the good work wasn't the best it could be. And now maybe you're providing a much better frame that is hopefully always becoming better. Um, what were, what were some of the cultural changes that, um, had become maybe necessary or do you have a list of things that that you can see changed in the past three years? Um, anything that comes to mind? Yeah, there is another thing that uh, beyond what I already mentioned, there's another thing that has served us very, very well. As I said at the beginning, innovation for us, it's a, it's a core value, right? Of It comes from the founding uh, from the founders, actually, uh, but it's something we want to we want to honor. And when I joined, there was um, this twenty percent time for uh, personal projects that some people copy from Google, and that was clearly not working. It was Fridays, and you could see that not much was done on Fridays. It was breaking the product sprints. People try to do something, but then. Somebody is out, you're always missing somebody, you lose focus from Friday to Friday. It's very important to get meaningful things done. Um, but we, don't, we didn't want to lose it. Um, so we did actually almost by chance, like let's try this, um, a proposal to move all the Fridays at the end of the quarter. So you have 13 Fridays in a quarter uh, and we just settled for two weeks because our sprints are two weeks. Um, we just said the last 10 days of the quarter, uh, it's Hive Sprints. Uh, Hive is in our internal language, uh, chapters and guilds of a Spotify. Um, and we're just going to have the Hive Sprint. So do the same thing you're doing on those Fridays or they're trying to do on those Fridays on those two weeks. 
business lost it because suddenly the products teams didn't have the Fridays. They get the Fridays back, right? They, they could really focus. Um, and then what happened on the first time we did that on those two weeks, it absolutely blew our mind. Um, we just said, we're going to have some pizzas on Monday. We actually could do this just once before COVID. Uh, so it went, it, it was remote in the second edition. We're going to have some pizzas on Monday. We're going to kick off ideas. Whoever wants to present something, present something. And then we're going to have a demo the last Friday. Uh, and then just do whatever. Actually have fun. It doesn't need to be productive. It doesn't need to be product oriented. You want to go read a book because you are a backend developer who wants to be a front-end developer, go do that. Um, let, we'll just meet on Friday and see what happens. And actually, that Friday demo was amazing. It was full of projects. It was full of demos. It was very festive. Actually, we were surprised how much people put actually production on the videos showing what they've done. Um, we had some prizes on the second edition, actually, also to to vote the best projects. And I personally was expecting that a lot of, I don't know, technical debt would pop up through that. The people would do a lot of tech stuff. And we were surprised that 60% of the projects were actually product functionalities. Um, and that happened time over time, quarter over quarter. We just did our eighth edition of this. Um, and we will keep doing it. And more or less, 50 to 60% of the projects are product oriented. People really deeply care about the product here. You can see this. Um, and now actually now, actually not now, from one year ago, um, some product managers actually book the product sprint after the high sprint to make sure those things end up in production, right? And it's a hackathon, so you're not always this production ready by the demo day. Um, but they naturally either get on the next sprint or maybe sometimes down the roadmap, of course. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a very festive moment. It's a celebration of that value. Uh, and, and plus we get a lot of interesting functionalities and cool ideas out of it. Um, that's amazing actually. Uh, so, uh, thank you for sharing that. I think we can now establish that most of the engineers are very product oriented. Yes. Um, would you be, a, would you think that, uh, that's a fair statement? Uh, be, because I hear it from a lot of people and I feel like it goes without saying these days that engineers aren't just, you know, these code building machines. They need to look at the big picture and understand what the product does that they, they are working on and also kind of think with the user's mindset and, and understand what things might come up. But from what you're saying, I gather that the engineers that you're working with are really into this and they are they are even in their free time they are caring for the product they, they care a lot there is also a lot that's very interesting and not product oriented eh? many many teams use these two weeks to actually really go deep into a standard for instance and really work around it um there is a lot of people that has been doing courses and actually that those ones we sponsored at the beginning a lot Courses from front-end development if you're a back-end developer and vice versa. It's always helpful and healthy that you know a little bit of everything. Um, some people actually, this last edition created the HiveConf, which is kind of an unconference. It's just one afternoon of lightning talks uh, where people want to present stuff. So it, like, it's taking shape in, in many, many aspects. There's a lot of interesting things going on. It's actually tough to pick, keep up with everything that's happening on the high sprints. But just the fact that without even asking for it, so much was product oriented was also was also interesting and we try to be very hands off uh, uh not trying to direct what the high sprint should be because it's also a very healthy temperature of the organization right it, it's very meaningful to see what people what people does when they have two weeks to themselves uh, and just observe the result thank you um and now as we are approaching uh, the end of our time we kind of touched on this, but I would like to get your explicit opinion. What, what is generally, or what was your specific role in, in changing the culture so much in, in scaling the company? Um, we, we talked about enabling people and we, we talked about people taking ownership for, for what they do and, 
and actually being responsible for for what they do and and giving people autonomy um how do you do you find the right balance how do you find the right direction you mentioned the company values a few times just give us a general overview of what you think a leader should do when scaling a company i think first you have to be very aware of the moment you are in like my role in this has been changing and it has been a a, a reflection of where were we what what are our problems and our possibilities too so when you join the first thing you have to do is to accept you don't know much right so listen a lot uh, and if people is complaining about something, it may not be literally true, but there is something down there, right? Like go, go and investigate. So that's the first phase. After this, you are set some direction. Um, and the first thing you can do there is own your mistakes, be super straight, super, super clear, um, and give people that reassurance of where you want to go. And that's going to take you some time because it's not easy to know where you want to go, right? And sometimes you'll make mistakes and you'll have to own them. Just be very, very humble on that regard. And then when things start moving on and you have a clear direction, people is moving there, it becomes much more an enabling, enablement game, right? That's the examples that we've given. Like how do you uh, support them and make sure that they can do and they can drive and that change sticks? That was a big problem for us. There was a, a lot of well-intended uh, change drive, but the change wouldn't stick. So one of the things you can do in that case for the situation is make sure the change sticks, right? That if we have agreement, if we have consensus, it happens. Um, and as this has been progressing, uh, the role has maybe become more long-term looking and more strategic in our, in our regard. Um, Clearly, talent is on a strategy and, and making sure that people join Stifle and growth and grow is, is, a, is a big thing. And the other one is innovation and change management because the scale ups change a lot. There is a lot of noise. There is a lot of change at the same time. So doing change properly and by properly, I mean with as little noise as possible, making sure people understand the why, making people, it's not a full time job to just keep up with change, right? Um, that's something we have learned that we didn't do good enough two years ago, right? Um, so as I, my role changes and all, everybody's role actually changes for this journey, not mine. Um, we have been focusing on that more and more. And definitely this year is a priority to do change management better and talent management better, give people better opportunities. Awesome. Um, so if that is the case, what were, what would some of the, cause here I have a question that says, what are the common mistakes, but really I want to turn it around and end on a high note and say, what are your most important takeaways? What if somebody is joining, um, a scale up that they are very passionate about, what would you warn them against or what would your your key takeaways be what should they watch out for the most what what should they kind of enable themselves to to do uh, I, yeah i'm thinking i think uh, most of my key takeaways are part of my interviewing pitch actually where i told candidates uh, um, uh, when i meet them about what to expect not the scale as, are not all the same. Like you can be a scale up with 50 employees and you can be a scale up with 500 employees, right? So you need to also know the company you is joining in what moment of the journey it is. You can expect different things, especially on engineering, but it's almost true for every department, right? So be very upfront on your interviews, ask for stuff, ask where are we with certain things? What do we do right? What do we do wrong? What are our bigger pains? Talk with people inside. If you know anybody inside, just get their opinion. You really need to understand the maturity moment and say, yeah, I'm up for it. I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna go there and fix things. And the second thing that I always tell everybody is if you are a manager or you are not a manager, you're gonna have your roadmap to execute on, you're gonna have your duties, um, you're gonna have people to take care either your peers or your direct reports. That's also very important. But there is also always a third leg of this, which is being an agent of change. You will look around, you'll see a lot of things that are not good enough, right? What we want from everybody is that you just don't stay on your lane doing your thing, but you help the department 
getting better. And the things that I mentioned, like high sprints and standards, can also articulate that. Right? You can everybody can be an agent of change because there is a lot of change, and we need that change uh, in order to keep up with growth, right? Uh, and if you are up for it. Um, and you like being the one, the one who wrote the playbook about something because there was no playbook about that before. Uh, I think a scale up is an amazing gig. Um, if you expect somebody to give you the playbook about everything, then probably scale up is not for you. Thank you. Um, a word of warning there for everyone. Yes. <laughs> um, we have touched on quite a few things. Um, I love the the part about hiring so intentionally yet so flexibly with people and the boot camp and also um conscious standard building mechanism for everyone i i also think that that is a great um great key takeaway is there anything else that you think is important for our listeners to know but we haven't touched on yet um, no, I think there are some uh, small uh, improvements that we did here and there. Many of them may be related on you got to place the quality bar where you have it. In our case, at the beginning was outages. We got to take care of this and then gradually raise the quality bar and make sure people can keep up with the demand of that was okay last year. It's not okay now, right? Like we're achieving for more and, and you do that as quickly as possible, but also making sure um, teams have time to catch up and own the next level, right? And you can handhold or you can train or whatever it's necessary. So I would say a lot of the changes we have not got talked about fall in that category. Um, and the rest is mostly, mostly what we have covered already. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Um, if our listeners would like to get in touch with you or follow your work. Where could they do that? I think they can follow me on Twitter. It's uh, P-M-I-N-O-V-E-S. First time I say my Twitter handle in English. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or LinkedIn, I guess. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today and, and sharing your experience at Typeform. Thank you, Dear Carolina. Dear listeners. I am Carolina Thoth, and uh, today I had the CTO of Typeform talking about scaling and changing cultures. And I think we had a really awesome conversation with such great takeaways. Pau Minoves, thank you for spending your time with us today. I am Carolina Thoth, and I hope to see you next time. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks for staying with Level Up Engineering. If you enjoyed this podcast, so will your friends. Share this episode on your favorite social networking platform. To stay up to date with our content, follow Level Up Engineering on Spotify, Apple Podcast, or Google Podcast. Brought to you by Coding Sans, a software development agency building web applications with Angular and Node.js. Check them out at codingsans.com. <laughs>